Let's begin by reading verses 1 through 6, Ezekiel chapter 45. Moreover, when you divide the land by lot into inheritance, you shall set apart a district for the Lord, a holy section of the land. Its length shall be 25,000 cubits, the width 10,000. It shall be holy throughout its territory all around. Of this there shall be a square plot for the sanctuary, 500 by 500 rods, with 50 cubits around it for an open space. So this is the district you shall measure, 25,000 cubits long, 10,000 wide. And it shall be the sanctuary, the most holy place. It shall be a holy section of the land, belonging to the priests, the ministers of the sanctuary, who come near to minister to the Lord. It shall be a place for their houses and a holy place for the sanctuary. An area 25,000 cubits long and 10,000 wide shall belong to the Levites, the ministers of the temple. They shall have 20 chambers as a possession. You shall appoint as the property of the city an area 5,000 cubits wide, 25,000 long, adjacent to the district of the holy section. It shall belong to the whole house of Israel. So you can see why I'm going to summarize because there's so much information here and, and much of it is just very difficult to, to bring an application to. But as we look at this, what we're seeing is that this chapter, chapter 45, is going to deal with the basic dividing of the land into sections and the sections are going to be in, into sections for the Lord. And Ezekiel is saying that the Lord is going to have a section of land that is set apart for his use. It's a portion of land that is basically in the center of Israel. It's eight and a half miles wide by 3.3 miles deep and it's going to be used in a special way for the Lord because you'll see that as we go through this it's a special way for the Lord as we shall soon see but what we have here are measurements and these measurements that we're looking at make up what has been called a, a holy rectangle eight and a half miles by 3.3 miles when you look at a map of Israel you're seeing sections from Judah north of Benjamin it goes towards the Mediterranean and you're just basically seeing sections of land that are being broken up into the usage of the Lord. But what you have, and, and we'll look at this for a moment, in verse 2 is uh, a special allotment for an area that will be used for the temple. And it's going to be used for the Jewish tribes as a worship center. It's going to be a worship center for not only the nation of Israel, but the whole world will come to visit and this particular section is going to be one square mile. Now Zechariah tells us in chapter 8 verse 22 that many peoples and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and to pray before the Lord. He says in chapter 14 verse 16 it shall come to pass that everyone who is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to worship the king the Lord of hosts and to keep the feast of tabernacles. And so this is going to be a place of worship. Now, as he speaks concerning the section that is designated for the use of the Lord in worship of God, notice verse 5. He says that there's going to be uh, separate from the land uh, a section that is devoted to the priests. In verse 6, just south of the sanctuary is another section, 8.5 by 1.65 miles, and that's going to be set apart for the city of Jerusalem. So what you have here are simple dimensions. Now, in verse 7, it says the prince shall have a section on one side and the other of the holy district and the city's property and bordering on the holy district and the city's property extending westward on the west side and eastward on the east side. The length shall be side by side with one of the tribal portions from the west border to the east border. This prince is the administrator. There's going to be somebody when the Lord Jesus Christ is reigning and ruling in the millennial kingdom, the thousand year reign of Christ, he's going to have somebody who's there who's referred to as the prince who will be his administrator. As I mentioned earlier, there are those who believe that this administrator could very well be King David. There are others who say this is one of his descendants. But this administrator is going to have property. The property is divided into two sections. There's a portion to the west and there's a, a, a section to the east of the temple. And so as this is taking place, I want you to see verses 8 through 12. It speaks of the land being his possession in Israel. Now notice he says, And my princes shall no more oppress my people, but they shall give the rest of the land to the house of Israel according to their tribes. Thus says the Lord God, Enough, O princes of Israel, 
remove violence and plundering, execute justice and righteousness, stop dispossessing my people, says the Lord God. You shall have honest scales, an honest ephah, an honest bath. The ephah and the bath shall be the same measure, so that the bath contains one-third of a homer, the ephah one-tenth of a homer. So Homer Simpson's going to be there. Interesting. Their measure, I shouldn't have said that. Why I say these things, I do not know. Their measure shall be according to the homer. The shekel shall be 20 jaras, 20 shekels, 25 shekels, and 15 shekels shall be your mina. Now, did that make sense to you? No, of course not. Um, what you're looking at here is basically fair administration. I'm going to talk to you about that for just a moment. What we see here, and the beauty of all of this, is there's no longer going to be political leaders who selfishly take advantage of people. That's what we're seeing in a practical way. The princes are more than likely uh, leaders over individual tribes in the nation of Israel. But what he's pointing out here, and the practical thing for us, is that there's going to be honest rule. And the honest rule is evidenced by honest commercial dealings. He actually is setting up standards for honest weights and measures. You can see that in Leviticus 19, verses 35 through 36, which speaks about just weights. But he's speaking concerning the fact that these political leaders will have something that today's leaders don't seem to have. They're going to be righteous leaders. The leaders during that time who will be serving under the administrator who is serving at the will of Jesus the Messiah, these leaders are going to be honest and they're going to have integrity. And these are going to be people who govern with concern to honor the Lord, and they're going to be people who actually are serving in order that, out of a, a love for people. I mean, sometimes we'll see on, on the side of, of car driving by to serve and to protect. Well, in reality, that's what's going to take place during this time. Obviously, we don't have many political leaders like this today at all. Obviously, what we have today is something entirely different. And something that we see, and I'm not saying this to people who don't see this too, we all see this, is sometimes what I see is I, I have people who have been elect, elected to official or to a position of office who uh, don't seem to realize that the money that they spend isn't theirs. They don't seem to have that concept. A and many, many uh, today don't seem to realize that they cannot spend themselves out of debt. And yet this is what we see today with the kind of rulership that we have. Now I was reading something, and I, I'm not going to bore you too much. I find this interesting, this kind of thing. But I was reading something today concerning the United States national debt. You might find this interesting. The national debt is somewhere around $12 trillion. $12 trillion, and it's actually growing every second that I speak. $12 trillion. Now, here's the thing. What does that mean? I mean, the word trillion doesn't mean anything to me. I don't have a concept of what trillion means. For me... If you say you have a million dollars, I still go, wow, that's a lot of money. A trillion dollars? If you say you have a billion dollars, that's an awful lot of money. But we Americans have become desensitized to numbers. We don't have a clue what that means. A million, a billion, a trillion. So when you read it concerning a national debt, being $12 trillion and growing every second I speak, most of us don't even blink. We don't have an idea what that actually means. Well, I was trying to figure out how to illustrate that, and I, I got some information off of a web page. Hopefully their mathematics is, are correct. One trillion, one trillion, one dollar bills stacked one on top of the other, one trillion would reach nearly 68,000 miles or about a third of the way from the earth to the moon. To put a trillion dollars in context, if you spend a million dollars every day 
since the day Jesus was born, you still wouldn't have spent a trillion dollars. You'd have spent probably three quarter of a trillion dollars if you were able to spend a million dollars every day. I wouldn't mind trying that, but <laughs> one million seconds, one million seconds equals 11 and a half days. A billion seconds is around 32 years. One trillion seconds is 32,000 years. If you spent a dollar a second, it would take you 32,000 years to spend a trillion dollars. Our national debt is 12 trillion dollars and growing. And so what we have is we have a lot of people in government today who don't seem to understand that the money that they are investing isn't theirs to invest. The money that they're spending isn't theirs to spend. It's your tax dollars that are being spent. That's the way human government is. That's how it works. But there's a day coming when there's going to be princes who rule under an administrator who rules under Jesus who are going to be ruling and uh, who are going to be serving with a love for God and a love for people. And, and that's what's going to be taking place during the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. People aren't going to be ripped off. People are not going to be bullied. People are not going to be having any problems like that. Now, what's interesting is... And, and this is something that I was thinking about as I was preparing this. It's interesting that you actually have government during the millennial reign of Christ. Government is established because during that thousand year reign that Jesus is ruling and reigning on the earth, there is still going to be sin. There's still going to be a problem with people and sin nature. Now, we the church, I believe very strongly that we will be raptured up we're going to have our glorified body. We're not going to have the ability to sin anymore because we're in glory with the Lord. But there are going to be those who come through the tribulation. And, and there are, there's going to be Israel, the nation of Israel is going to be purged through the tribulation. And so people are going to come through that tribulation. They're going to be worshipers of God. And they're going to continue to live in, in bodies that have yet to be glorified because they didn't die. They're going to have children. Their children are born with a sin nature. And so where there is a sin nature, there will be human government. And so during this time, this thousand year reign, there are going to be people who need to be governed. So the government of this nature is needed because society needs to operate smoothly and it needs to operate in order. Now, they're going to have honest weights and they're going to have honest measures. And that's basically what he's speaking about there. Now, in verses 13 through 17, he speaks about an offering that will be offered. So the people are going to be providing for the prince. The prince, in turn, is going to use what is given that he may make offerings. And the offerings will be provided by the prince out of what he receives from the people. And that's why there is still a need for offerings, because the people are still aware of their need for forgiveness. Now, the offerings that are made in many ways are going to be memorial offerings looking back to the finished work of Jesus Christ. But it's an awareness of the fact that they still have the capacity of sinning. When you get into verses 18 through 25, those verses contain uh, various feasts that are going to be celebrated. And in verses 18 through 25, you see Passover, unleavened bread, and the Feast of Tabernacles. But three of the feasts are not mentioned. Those are the Feasts of Pentecost, the Feast of Trumpets, and the Day of Atonement. Those have been completely fulfilled. They're not going to be remembered. But what you have is you have a new feast that has been established. I'll read verses 18, and 20, 18 through 20. It says, Thus says the Lord God, In the first month, on the first day of the month, you, sh you shall take a young bull without blemish and cleanse the sanctuary. The priest shall take some of the blood of the sin offering and put it on the doorpost of the temple, on the four corners of the ledge of the altar, on the gate posts of the gate of the inner court. And so you shall do on the seventh day of the month, 
for everyone who has sinned unintentionally or in ignorance. Thus you shall make atonement for the temple. And so what you have is you have feast, this feast that's going to emphasize the holiness of the temple. As he said here, it's going to last a week. People have entered into the millennium. They've had children that continue to sin. And therefore, offerings continue needing to be made. Verse 21, in the first month of the 14th day of the month, you shall observe Passover, a feast of seven days. Unleavened bread shall be eaten. And on that day, the prince shall prepare for himself and for all the people of the land a bull for the sin offering. On the seven days of the feast, he shall prepare a burnt offering to the Lord. Seven bulls, seven rams without blemish, daily for seven days, and a kid of the goats daily for a sin offering. He shall prepare a grain offering of one ephah for each bull and one ephah for each ram, together with a hin of oil for each ephah. In the seventh month, on the fifteenth day of the month, at the feast, he shall do likewise for seven days according to the sin offering, burnt offering, grain offering, and the oil. Now, Passover, unleavened bread, tabernacles are going to continue to be observed. Now, Passover and unleavened bread are usually celebrated together. Feast of Tabernacles is done later in the, in the Jewish calendar. Passover reminds the nation of Israel of God when he sent the death angel who passed over the uh, homes of those who had placed the blood uh, over their doorposts. And so the Passover is an ancient feast for the nation of Israel to remind them that God passed over and spared the firstborn of those who by faith had applied that blood to the doorpost. They also had the unleavened bread that went along with that and that celebrated even to this day during Passover unleavened bread. Tabernacles was a feast to remind them as they were there in the wilderness, they would take tents and they would place them outside and to this day, when you go into Jerusalem during this feast day, they, there are many who will actually be camped outside of their houses on top of the roofs and all as a remembrance. And as they were there, they would have these thatched roofs and they'd be able to look through the thatched roofs and they see the stars and they would remember that it was God who protected them and took them through and provided for them when they were in their wilderness experience. These are all precursors of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ who is going to be our Passover lamb who has taken us and provided for us. And so when they're celebrating this, these are memorial feasts remembering what the Lord Jesus Christ has done on their behalf. How that Jesus Christ has been their deliverer. Now one of the things that we as believers know concerning Jesus is that Jesus came to set us free. In the Gospel of John, in chapter 8, uh, verses 34 through 36, this is something that, that he said. He said, I say unto you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever. But a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. So Jesus Christ came and he said, Look, at, I am here to deliver you. I am here as a Passover lamb who takes away the sin of the world. And I have come to be the one who delivers you. And I am the one who provides for you. And so when the Lord Jesus Christ was speaking to his people and speaking by, by way of application to those who would come after those who lived during that first century, he was saying to all of us, he was saying, listen, I have come to set you free. Now, what you have right now, he is saying, is a life of sin because you are in bondage and the person who is in sin is also in bondage. You're a slave. You're a slave to that sin. All you need to do is speak to somebody who's honest and, and ask them if they don't know the Lord and they have some besetting sin, something that they're dealing with, with something that they're struggling with. All you need to do is ask them and ask them this, are you free? And, and if they're honest, they'll say, no, I'm not. Speak to the alcoholic. Ask the person who can't take just a single drink. Ask the person who has to drink not only that beer, but has to drink the six pack if he's free. Ask the person who can't have just one shot. He has to drink the whole bottle. Ask the person if they're drinking that, that bottle of wine. If, ask them if you can have just one glass of wine with your meal. The alcoholic can't. He has to have every bit of wine that's in that bottle. And they're in bondage to it. And when they speak to you and they open their hearts to you, if they're honest with you, and if there's a moment that they might really be real with you, they will confess and they will say, you know, to be honest with you, this is something that I really have a struggle with. Now, there's that course of denial that sometimes they'll say, oh, I can give up any time I want. As a matter of fact, I've given up a thousand times and I can do it again tomorrow. It's a habit that they have. And they don't want to even admit it sometimes. But once in a while, they will get to that point of honesty. You see, that's where you got to and that's where I got to. 
Before I came to Christ, I finally got to the point in my life where I started realizing that what I was was not normal. I thought that pretty much everybody was similar to me, that people had their hang-ups. It may be that I have this alcohol problem, this drug problem, this problem with girls and all of that. I've got my problem, but you got your problems too. All of us have problems. And so if you came to me and started trying to tell me that I was in bondage, for the longest time I'd have, I would have argued with you. I'd have said, that's not true. I'd have said, listen, you know what? I can give this up anytime I want. I simply don't want to. I don't want to because I enjoy it. And so a lot of people are like that. And what we do is we begin to make excuse for the things that have us in bondage. But after a while, after messing so many people up, my family and, and those who I cared for, after a while, I can still remember beginning to think, God, there is something wrong with me. I just can't have one drink. I'm not that person who can drink just one drink. I was a person that if you were seated across the table with me and we were sharing some wine, if you got up and walked away, I was the guy who drank that wine as you were gone. And when you came back and you say, what happened to my wine? I'd say, I don't know, man. Somebody came and took it. And I was the one who did it. And that was just the way I was. And I thought it was normal for the longest time. And then finally, I came to realize I can't stop. I can't stop the lying. I can't stop the drinking. I can't stop taking the drugs. I can't stop lying to the girls. I can't stop. That's something that's so ingrained in me that it is me. And that took the Holy Spirit to finally say, you're in bondage. You are a slave to your sin. But when the Lord Jesus Christ through the gospel, set you free. That's why he says, you shall be free completely. You shall be free indeed. Paul speaking in Romans chapter 6, verse 6, said it this way. He said, our old man was crucified with him. Now, he's not talking about your dad. He's talking about your old nature. Our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. You see, I came a long time ago to begin to embrace Philippians 4.13 and John 15.5. In John 15.5, Jesus said, Without me, you can do nothing. But in Philippians 4.13, Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And you get to that point where you understand that in Jesus Christ, I have a finished work. You see, when Jesus died on the cross, when Jesus Christ gave up and said, it is finished, he paid the total cost. I don't add a single thing to salvation other than the sins that he forgives me for. I receive salvation by faith. I ask God by his merciful grace to forgive a sinner such as me. And I said, God, in Jesus' name, wash me and cleanse me because I had heard the gospel message that said that by the blood of Jesus Christ, I shall be cleansed of all sin. Not just some sin, not just past sins, all sin. And that was such good news that it was gospel. The word gospel, when you hear people preaching the gospel, that speaks of great news, and that's what it is. It's God's great news of forgiveness and compassion and mercy that he extends to us, that we can have a right relationship with God, and that the Lord can justify us, make us as if we never sinned at all, and he can impute to us the righteousness of Christ so that when we stand before God, we are clothed in his righteousness and we're capable of entering into heaven. And that's how it works. And Jesus Christ said that. He said, listen, if you are in sin, you're a slave to it. And as a slave, you don't enter into the house. But, he says, a son can abide in the house. And so what God did is God made us sons through Jesus Christ, sons and daughters through the Lord Jesus Christ. And what we end up with is a brand new life in Jesus Christ. So when they take these offerings and make them, it's not so that there's some effectiveness that's going to take place, but they're looking back at what God has already accomplished on the cross through his son Jesus Christ. And as a result of that, they can do these things, these sacrifices and these feasts in commemoration of the reality of it being fulfilled by God through the Son, Jesus Christ. Now moving into chapter 46, it looks like we're going to be able to do both chapters. I do believe in miracles. In chapter 46, what you have in chapter 46 is a, summar a summarization <clears throat> of uh, worship and the offerings that take place during the millennium. 
And, and what you have in chapter 46 is you have Sabbath and new moon offerings. You have feast days and voluntary offerings. You have daily sacrifices. If you want to take a note and you really want to look at this closely, all you need to do is look at Numbers chapter 28 and you can see the details of those offerings. But the thing that I want to emphasize as we look at chapter 46 is in the history of Israel, Israel often failed. And Israel failed to observe these things and was judged because of that. Now, I'm going to read verse 1. It says, Thus says the Lord God, the gateway of the inner court that faces toward the east shall be shut the six working days. But on the Sabbath it shall be opened, and on the day of the new moon it shall be opened. Now, I want to talk to you for just a moment. I want you to see this. Notice how it speaks concerning on the Sabbath. Now, the Sabbath, I want to speak a little bit about that with you because obviously... The church, and I've had this question asked, and that's why I'm going to take some time to answer it. Obviously, the church uh, meets on Sundays. I've had people ask me, why does the church meet on Sundays and um, you don't keep the Saturday Sabbath like the nation of Israel does? The church historically has met on Sunday, the first day of the week, but the nation of Israel historically has kept the Sabbath. Now the reason that we have Sunday services is because it was on the first day of the week that Jesus was resurrected. You see that in Luke chapter 24 and, and, and Jesus was resurrected on that first day and the church has by habit been meeting on Sundays all along. The early church had the habit of meeting on Sunday morning. You see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 verse 2. You see it alluded to in the book of Acts, chapter 20, verse 7. So the early church had a habit of meeting together the first day of the week to commemorate the resurrection day. Jesus was resurrected the first day of the week, and therefore the church meets on Sunday, the first day of the week. Now, there's arguments about that. People have arguments about that all the time. Years ago now, I finished a Sunday morning service and, and a lady approached me after the church service and I was speaking to her and she said to me, I have a word from the Lord that I'd like to share with you. Will you receive a word from the Lord? I'm, I, I believe that God has a way of speaking and if he wants to have a prophetic word, I'm, I'm willing to listen to it and test it. I don't have a problem with that. We're not to despise prophecies. And should the Lord have a word, I want to hear it. And so I said to her, well, of course. And she, she kind of cleared her throat because that's what prophets usually do. <clears throat> she cleared her throat, took a deep breath. Normally it's in King James, but this time it wasn't. Because Jesus liked King James. I think Jesus spoke King James, if I'm not mistaken. But... As she was speaking to me, she said, Thus saith the Lord, basically. Um, if you were to meet, she said, The Lord is moving here on Sundays. But if you were to begin meeting on Saturdays, then God says that he has a work that is wonderful to behold. And I said, That's not the Lord. That's you. And, and she didn't really appreciate that. But the spirit of the prophet is subject unto the prophet, and we're to test prophecies. And so the bottom line is this. And I said, that's not the Lord. That's you. Because one, the church meets on Sunday because that's when the church habitually is met from the resurrection day of Jesus Christ. And, and secondly, well, I'll give it to you out of Scripture. In, in Romans chapter 14, verse 5, one person esteems one day above another. Another esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. One person thinks that this day is more special than, than other days. Another says every day is a special day to the Lord. And I have a mind, by the way, that's more like that. Every day is a special day as unto the Lord. You know, this is Wednesday. This isn't Sunday, yet you're in church. 
Every day is a special day to the Lord. That's why you can have a Monday Bible study, a Tuesday Bible study, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, a Sunday Bible study. That's why you can be in the Word of God every day of the week. And every day is equally important in the eyes of some as it is to somebody else. Then there are others that say, no, no, no. No, Sunday is the most important day of the week. I'm of the mind that will say, you know what? Sunday is a great day too. The church habitually met on Sunday. I'm with you on that. Let's have Sunday services. But let's also have Monday services and let's get together on, on Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and let's serve God every day. Why not? So what you end up with is you have one person who's arguing it's only Saturday. You have another person who's arguing it's only Sunday. Then you have somebody else who says every day is holy. Now, we meet on Sundays as a general rule because it's the resurrection day of Christ. But the Sabbath was not given to the church. The Sabbath was given to the people of Israel. In Exodus chapter 31 verse 16, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations as a perpetual covenant. And so the children of Israel continue even during the millennial time of Christ to meet on the Sabbath because that was the day that was given to them. And as they gather together during that time when Jesus is ruling and reigning for that thousand years on the earth, they will continue to observe the Sabbath and they will be offering sacrifices. Again, those sacrifices are what we call memorial offerings. Now, in verse 2, you see the prince. And he says, the prince shall enter by way of the vestibule of the gateway from the outside, stand by the gatepost. The priest shall prepare his burnt offering and his peace offerings. He shall worship at the threshold of the gate. Then he shall go out, but the gate shall not be shut until evening. So this prince is once again mentioned, and he's mentioned several times in relation to sacrifices. Now, when you get to verse 10, it says, the prince shall then be in their midst. When they go in, he shall go in. When they go out, he shall go out. At the festivals and at the appointed feast days, the grain offering shall be enough for a bull, etc. Verse 12, when the prince makes a voluntary burnt offering or voluntary peace offering to the Lord, the gate that faces toward the east shall be opened for him. He shall prepare his burnt offering, his peace offerings, as he did on the Sabbath day. Then he shall go out, and after he goes out, the gate shall be shut. The prince. I want to talk to you about that for just a moment here. Verse 2, verses 10 through 12, those verses reveal something about the prince that I want to speak about for just a moment. It reveals that he is going to be an example. He's going to be an example of spiritual integrity and worship. And his example is something that is intended to be an encouragement to the people. Because I want you to see this. Notice in verse 10 how it says, the prince shall then be in their midst. It's another way of saying that he's going to be amongst them, but will be an example to them. He's the one who openly worships God, makes, uh, makes sure that offerings are provided, etc. And so I would say this to you guys, you know, by way of application, speaking about the prince, he's, he's ruling there under Jesus Christ. People are looking to him. I would say this to you, just to apply this scripture in some way. Always remember, always remember that you are an example to somebody else when it comes to worshiping God. You are an example. I can't emphasize that too much. I haven't always been aware of that. When I was a new believer, I had the attitude, if you don't like the way I am, this was my attitude, well, then that's really too bad for you, isn't it? Because I'm who I am, and I'm going to be as real as I can. And if I'm this way, that's just the way I am. It took me years, years, 
many years to realize that that attitude on my part was absolutely self-centered and selfish. I didn't realize that. I thought I was simply being authentic. I thought I was just being real, being honest, being true to myself. And it took years for the Lord to finally teach me that I was supposed to be an example of a believer. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12. Paul was speaking to a young pastor and he said, Let no one despise your youth, but be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. You see, Paul, when he was speaking to the Corinthian church in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, told them, you are living letters known and read by all men. You are living letters. You see, I might be able to give you the Greek word for love, various ways that it was used, the history of the word, and even biblical applications. But if I don't love you, that I'm just a sounding gong. I'm just making noise. If, if, I, if I can teach you lessons on generosity or patience, if I can share things about mercy and compassion, uh, uh, having a heart to forgive, I, I, I can teach Bible studies like that. I did. But if I don't have those things in my life, you tell me what the, what the lesson is that you're going to learn. It's, it's not going to be simply my words. Now, on, on one hand, of course, I have one of those positions where I come and I speak and 99.9% and .9 of the church doesn't know me in any other context other than what you're experiencing right now. I understand that. And, and, I, and I might be the kind of person who could give, a, a, you know, a passionate presentation of, of love and forgiveness and, and be tearful about that. But if I leave this platform and I don't live that, and so the Lord began to minister a long time ago that, that if you don't have love, you don't have anything. And you're to be an example. You see, my, my kids... I've taught them all of their life various lessons. But if I don't live those lessons in front of my kids, you tell me what they're going to be like. They're going to be like me. My sons will love their wives like I love mine. My dad, in my life, I can't remember ever to the day he went home to be with the Lord, I don't remember my father ever sitting me down and teaching me about loving a woman, ever. My dad was one of these modest men, quiet men. My dad was the kind of man that he never lectured. When I was 17, I, I had done something wrong and my dad was upset with me and my dad had said to me, you could have spoken to me. You could have told me, David. And I was 17 years old, and I still remember this because I looked at my dad and I said, Dad, I could have talked to you. I said, I'm 17 years old, and I can count on one hand the conversations you and I have had. My dad was a quiet man. My, da my dad didn't talk. I mean, I would walk into the den. My dad would be watching TV. I would sit down. He wouldn't even notice that I was there commercial would hit, he'd turn and look at me and say, how you doing? And I would have a minute to three minutes to tell him when they came back on, you know, Bonanza's on, we've got to watch that, and that's what would happen. And that was my communication with my dad. I never saw my dad kiss my mom romantically in my life. I never walked in and saw my dad holding and smooching my mom. My dad was not that way. My dad didn't even, didn't even, he'd maybe give her a little, you know, kiss on the cheek once in a blue moon, and that was it. He, he never lectured me about loving my family. He never lectured me about being an honest man, working hard. 
He never taught me anything like that, not by words, but by action he did. By action he did. I saw a man who loved a woman with his dying breath. I saw a man when my dad was dying, when my dad had the heart attack that was his ticket to heaven, that when I came to the house, my mom said, your daddy just prayed for me. Daddy had a heart attack. You know what he prayed? I said, what? He said, Jesus, take care of my wife. That was my dad. He didn't even pray for himself when he was dying. He prayed for my mom. And that was a lesson that I saw lived out. So I believe that you should preach at all times and when necessary, use words. Because your life is an example. What you worship, people will know. Your reputation is what they see you to be. And so if you're known for being a solid Christian, it's not just because you talk a lot about Jesus. It's because you love Jesus. And the prince is going to be an example of somebody who openly worships God. And they'll see this in him. The prince shall be in their midst. They will see someone who is open in their worship of God. And that's what God has called us to be. God has called us to be open about our worship, open about who we love. I'm not ashamed to stand before anybody and say, I'm in love with my wife. I'm not ashamed of saying I love my kids. I'm not ashamed of those things at all. And if I'm not ashamed of saying I love my wife and I love my kids, why would I be ashamed of saying I love Jesus Christ? And why would I withhold the most important person? You see, people can know Marie. That doesn't get them into heaven. They need to know Jesus Christ. And so we need to have an openness about our faith, something that we're willing to be known for. And the prince has that. He goes before the people. Now, I have to close and I have to rush to do this. In verses 13 through 15, he speaks about making, uh, he says, you shall daily make a burnt offering to the Lord. That offering is a daily or constant offering. It's a reminder daily of how people are made right before God. It's a way of keeping worship of God out in the open because worshiping God is the right thing to do. Worshiping God isn't something that is to be shameful or kept private. It's something that we're open about. And thus they have these offerings that are open and it's regular offerings. And finally, verses 16 all the way to verse 25, you have various things that are spoken of. Verses 16 through 18 speak of the laws of inheritance. Basically all that speaks of is that when the, the prince gives gifts to his son, those gifts are to be owned by their ki his kids permanently. Gifts that he gives his servants will return to him in what has been called the year of Jubilee. That's 50 years later, up to 50 years later, or that's when the Jubilee was celebrated every 50 years. And finally, in verse 18, the prince doesn't confiscate others' property to enlarge his own holdings. Verses 19 through 24 just closes with the priest's kitchens and chambers that are placed in convenient locations. They had priests. And when a man wanted to approach God, there has been a priest. And the priest would help that man to approach God. That's what priests were intended to do. We have a great high priest, Jesus Christ. And I don't have to go through a man. I go through my Savior, Jesus. I don't have to, I don't have to make an appointment with him. I don't have to text him. I don't have to make a phone call. All I have to do is open my mouth or open my heart. And I can speak to him anytime I want to. And I can speak to God because I have a relationship with his son. Jesus said, he's the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. The Old Testament had a system of priesthood. Those priests would make their offerings. 
and their responsibility was helping the indiv individual to be able to have access to God through those sacrifices. During the millennium, Jesus is ruling and reigning. Priests will still be offering sacrifice, but to remind the people that that's how they have relationship with God is through Jesus who fulfilled those sacrifices because they were only types of what Jesus Christ really is. But ultimately what happens is there's a reminder that the way you have a relationship with God is not through some other man. The way you have a relationship with God is through the one man, Jesus Christ. And you can come to him and you can speak to him. My friend Bill, who was very dear to me from the time we were like five years old, had started going to a church called Calvary Chapel and was trying to tell me that I needed God. And I didn't like it. I didn't like the fact that this guy was constantly, what I thought, pushing Jesus down my throat because I thought I already had a relationship with God through Jesus because I'd been raised in the Catholic Church. So I was definitely sure that he was wrong and I was right. But he kept insisting that I didn't know God and it got me so upset that I finally did something I hadn't done in a long time. I made an appointment with the parish priest. I went to St. Pius X Church in Santa Fe Springs and I gave a call and I said, I have to talk to a priest. And I made an appointment with one of the priests there and, and I went in and spoke to him. And when I sat down across from this priest, I told him, I've got a friend, he's a Protestant, and he keeps telling me that I'm supposed to accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and my Savior. And I keep telling him, I'm a Catholic, I already know God, you're the one who doesn't know God. I said, so the reason I'm coming to you is because I want you to give me some answers to give to this guy so I can get him off my back because he's keeping telling me about Jesus and I don't like it. And I'll never forget this conversation. I was 19 years old, 40 years ago. And the priest looked at me and leaned back in his chair, kind of folded his arms. He said, you know, I tried Eastern religion for a while. I tried this and that philosophy. He said, I came back. The Catholic, being a Catholic, don't worry about it, you'll be okay. That was his answer. That was his answer. And I looked at him. Now, man, you have to understand something. I was a druggie. You know, I'd been doing drugs and smoking pot almost every day for a long time, and that didn't make sense to me. That just didn't make sense to me. I thought, if you really knew God, wouldn't you be a little more passionate about it than that? If you really knew God, wouldn't you be concerned that someone's trying to take me away? I started thinking like that. And that wasn't something I invented. That was the Holy Spirit. That was the Holy Spirit. And I went back home and I started thinking, something's wrong here. I've got some friend, my friend Bill, who is positive that he knows Jesus Christ and I've got some priest who doesn't care whether I do or I don't. And that's just the truth. That was my experience. May not have been yours. That was mine. And I started thinking about it. And I started realizing that maybe what I've been thinking is true all along, maybe it's not. Maybe it's deeper than what I'm giving it credit for. And it wasn't too much time after that that the Spirit of the Lord brought that sense of conviction and made it very clear to me that my religion, my religion was not going to get me into heaven and that my friend Bill, what he was saying was accurate and true. I needed a relationship with God through Jesus, my high priest, and I had to stop looking to man to be my mediator. And I had to go to the man, Jesus Christ, who is my mediator, that I might have a relationship with God through the only one who could bring me to God, the Son of God himself, Jesus Christ. There's a system of priests 
They're there to make the sacrifices only to remind the people of Israel that the true sacrifice has already been given, and that's Jesus. And those sacrifices are simply memorials. The way that you and I receive communion, realizing what Jesus has done for us, they're sacrifices that are memorials reminding them that the only way that you can have a relationship with God is through the true sacrifice, Jesus himself.